So would you pray with me? Father, this is your message, and it's uh, your church. These people belong to you, and I belong to you. And so I pray that what happens tonight would simply be your spirit at work. Through your word, through your truth, and through the gifts that you've given. But Lord, I ask that each of us would again go away with a strong sense that we have heard from you and not just a man. Mm -hmm. Father, most of us are, are acquainted with a lot of your word. And we've heard a lot of sermons before. But I pray that tonight we would not just put it on autopilot, but help us to lean forward in our spirit and anticipate what you're going to say to us. Speak well, strong, and deep, I pray. And may we respond in obedience, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you, uh, first of all, um, what you like most about Jesus. When you think of Jesus as uh, your Lord and your Savior, what is it that you appreciate most about him? Anybody? His unfailing love. All right. He keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. He's, he's trustworthy. He's faithful. He forgives our sins. He's a forgiver. All right. His kindness. His kindness. He loves us absolutely with an everlasting love, unconditional love. He's accessible. He's accessible, available. Yes? He loves us enough to chastise us. All right, he loves us enough to uh, not only tell us the truth, but at times <laughs> correct us, get our attention. <laughs> That's the old uh, joke about hitting the mule over the head of the two-by-four. Not punishing him, I'm just getting his attention. <laughs> Anything else? <coughs> All right. It's the only thing that really makes sense in the world, otherwise free. All right. He makes sense. He, uh, he changes the whole view of the future. So there's a reason why uh, we have a blessed hope. And it's because of, of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Right? Well, you guys are about like every other group I've talked to. Um, you, you really like the soft and, uh, and kind and gentle sides of Jesus. Um, nobody said that you really like his leadership <laughs> or his control. Which doesn't surprise me. Um, but the, the thing that's always missing when I ask that question in groups like this is nobody says that they love his intelligence, his genius. And that uh, doesn't surprise me anymore. It used to. But you see, the Lord Jesus is the total repository of all wisdom and knowledge. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge. You have ne you've never met anybody smarter than Jesus. You never will. He is the wisest, smartest, <coughs> greatest intellect you will ever encounter. Which simply means that it was Jesus who decided that you and I would see with eyes and that we would see in color, which makes it so much more interesting. He's the one that designed the nerves behind your eye that transmit the signals of light back to your brain. He's the one that decided how the brain would interpret that. 
He's the one who designed your ear, your inner ear, and decided that you would be able to hear this range of sounds from low to high. He's the one who decided that music would be a great addition to his creation. He's the one who designed the butterflies, and the bees, and the flowers, the lakes, the rivers, the mountains, the animals, the birds. And he not just designed it, he sustains it. In other words, the whole world functions according to his will. And the whole complex thing of cells and chromosomes and genes and all the way all of that stuff works together in a body like we have with the systems, the heart, the you know, respiratory system, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the digestive system, the reproductive system, all of that is the product of his intellect. Nothing was made that was made without him. Now why am I going on and on about how smart Jesus is? For the simple reason that he selected his message as carefully as he did anything else. He is the Word of God. He is the living Word. He is very sensitive to language. He created language. He created your speaking ability. He decided that we would be able to make sounds and interpret them and understand what each other are saying. And so he's very sensitive to that whole area of speech and words and language. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. There is nothing he did when he announced his gospel, his good news, that was a throwaway. That was a casual, oh yeah, by the way, you know. He didn't just throw things in. He designed his message as precisely as he designed your brain. That's why we have to take it so seriously. You see, something happened in our world about 50 years ago, maybe 60 years ago now. I was a child in the 50s, and something was happening uh, in, in the world about that time. Television was starting to come into its own. Radio had already flourished. I mean, I remember growing up listening to Hopalong Cassidy and The Lone Ranger and you know, all of those radio dramas. And uh, it was so much fun when you created the whole story in your mind as you listened to the, to the radio. But television was coming. And along with television came uh, a, a new profession. Salesmanship and marketing became a science and an art. And it wasn't long before you could take sales and marketing at the university level, and you could get graduate degrees in selling people things, in creating ads, uh, commercials. And what happened is very, very smart people, very capable people, learned how to sell. And the church, without thinking about it, turned them loose on the gospel. And so we began to take the message of Jesus, without remembering how smart he is, without remembering how carefully he designed his message, and we decided we could improve it. We could improve it. Bad assumption. But what we did was say, well, what would make it more palatable? What would make the message of, of Jesus more user-friendly? 
What would make more people listen? How could we deliver it easier? And so we began to, to work with the message and strip it down and remove things that we thought might get in the way and add things that we thought would make it easier to swallow. And so we came up with a gift-based gospel. Now, does the New Testament talk about salvation as a gift? Yes. Theologically, it is a gift. But interestingly enough, Jesus never called it a gift. He never presented it as a gift. Now, what do we do when we say it's just a grace gift? We think we're smarter than Jesus. There's a reason why Jesus didn't say it that way. And the reason is that when you give people a gift, it's non-confrontational. In other words, they do not have to deal with who it is they're getting the gift from. Jesus is not just our forgiver. Friend. He's not just offering a gift of forgiveness. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. That's who died for you. And that makes all the difference in terms of how you receive what he has done for you. We're going to talk a little bit about the way Jesus presented his message tonight. And uh, I, I hope you'll just take what I just said about how smart he is, take that to heart, and think with me about how he talked to individuals. He never used the same approach twice. Well, it came close. I mean, the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus, for instance, were both rich uh, men. They responded very differently. But... Uh, we're going we're gonna to take a look at, first of all, the military officer. And you remember that uh, in Luke chapter 7, let's take our Bibles and, and look at these passages because I think you'll enjoy actually thinking through the, the text with me. If you don't have your Bible and your neighbor does, just kind of lean over and, and read along with them, all right? Chapter uh, 7 of Luke, verse 1, it says this, After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent his friend, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I, too, am a man under, set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, including his disciples, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Other translations say, such great faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Well, let me just unpack this a little bit. At that time in history and in that part of the world, you treated royalty different than you did other people. For instance, uh, when you wanted to appeal to the king, you went up the chain of command and you asked the leaders above you to represent you to the authority above them, which is exactly what this man did. He asked the leaders of the city to represent him and to go to Jesus and ask if he would come and heal the servant. So he was treating Jesus as if he was a king, 
as if he was the authority over the officials of the city. Then, when he heard that Jesus didn't just say the word, he, he had come to his house, or was almost to his house, he, he was aghast. He, he, sent a, he sent friends with the message, Oh, you don't need to come to my house. I know who you are. I know your authority. All you have to do is say the word. And then he goes into that little description of how he as a man under authority, as an officer in the Roman army, knew how to use authority to tell soldiers what to do. Do this, do that, come, go. And people under authority responded appropriately. He says, basically, I know your authority. I'm just asking you to do what I know you have the right and the power to do. And Jesus turned to the crowd and said, this guy gets it. This is what I'm after. This is great faith. Now most of us would look at that and say, what, what do you mean this is great faith? This is operating as if Jesus is who he really is. It's treating him as if he was the authority above all authorities, as if he has the power to do what he should be able to do if he's, if he's God. This man was treating Jesus as if he was God and had the power to heal. Say the word and his servant would be healed. So let's take this apart, because here's what I want to do. I want to set up a pattern which will help us understand how Jesus approached each person. My theory is this. When Jesus approached a human heart, he was looking at the kingdom issues. In other words, what it was in that life that the control of that life was built around. What it was that a person thought they had to have other than God. What it was they used as their claim to fame or as the basis of their value system. I would call that uh, our individual kingdom. And in this case, uh, I'm using the kingdom of self to represent that. Uh, the burgundy side of the, uh, the little castles up there. So the kingdom issues is here's a man uh, who was powerful. He was part of the invading force. Uh, he, he was the captain of a hundred uh, soldiers, a centurion. Century, century, you know, centurion, a hundred. He understood the chain of command. He was important, he was influential, and he could have used his power in very different ways than he did. He used it to help the people of the area. And uh, apparently he had already decided there was something special that God was doing in this land. And he had helped build a synagogue. The evidence of repentance that had already taken place in this man's life, he treated Jesus as if he was God. He respected and honored Jesus. He considered himself unworthy even to have Jesus come into his home. He believed Jesus was God and he treated him accordingly. So Jesus called this, this respect, it's kind of probably what we would call it, this honor that this man gave him, he called it great faith. And then he turned to his disciples and said, I haven't seen anything like this among my disciples, among my followers. This is great faith and this is he holds this man up as Exhibit A. This is what I'm looking for. But you'll notice that it, it was about how this man understood authority to function and how he functioned under authority. Very key to understanding faith. See, a lot of us think of faith as completely devoid of anything that has to do with authority. It's just about believing truth. But Jesus is defining faith, not us. 
Jesus is saying faith has to do with the way you operate under authority, not just whether you believe something's true or not. Recognition of great faith. Um, one of the things I love to do when I, I teach in uh, men's retreats is I like to title the whole weekend <coughs> Men Under Authority. And then teach men, step by step, how to follow Jesus with tremendous respect for who he is. Not so that you stop making stupid mistakes and stop shooting yourself in the foot, and, you know, stop uh, getting off the track, but because of who he is, because he's worthy, because Respect and honor is due his name. And I see men uh, who have always taken Jesus for granted. I mean, they've got a Sunday school Jesus. Jesus is there to serve them. Jesus is there to forgive them. Jesus is there to get them to heaven. But they don't see him as the master of the universe. They don't see him as the Lord of all creation. They don't see him as the smartest man they've ever met. The wealthiest man they've ever met. The most powerful man they've ever met. They see him as a Sunday school flannel graph figure. It's kind of still locked in their brain. But when men catch on to the fact that Jesus is the best leader in the universe, that he's worth following, that he's worth giving your life to and your loyalty to and your respect to and your honor to, your obedience to, well, that changes everything. Then a faith is born that follows instead of just believing. Here's the rich young ruler. Very different situation. Mark chapter 10. Um, so drop back one book to Mark 10 and verse 17. Again, let's see if, if this little model that we're, we're building here works and, and uh, how it works. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, we're talking about the perfect witnessing opportunity. I don't know how many times I've heard preachers tell stories about sitting down on an airplane, opening their Bible to have devotions, and the guy next to him says, Oh, what is, is that a Bible? Uh, I've always been interested in what, what's in that book. Um, well, are you a Christian? Oh, well, that's great. How did you become a Christian? You know, <laughs> it's never happened to me. But I've heard other people describe these kinds of conversations. And I'm thinking, wow, what a right opportunity, you know. Here's one of those opportunities. A young man runs up, falls on his knees in front of Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? I mean, this is the perfect time to give him the gospel, right? Look what Jesus does with it. I mean, he totally flubs it. <laughs> Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. What he's saying is, do you think I'm God? <laughs> Why? Because that would make all the difference. You know the commandments, he said. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, I mean, he could have said, you rotten little liar. <laughs> I know you. I know your heart. You haven't kept these things from your youth. What about this time? What about that time? What about the other time? He didn't do that. It says he saw his earnestness, he looked at him, loved him, appreciated the fact that he'd been trying, at least. And then he said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come.
come follow me. Disheartened by that the same, the young man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What was Jesus doing? Why did he bring the law into it? Anyway. This, I know we don't do that today. But we can learn something very important here from Jesus. Why did he bring the law into it? What did the Apostle Paul said the law was good for? Teachers. To convict. To convict. And it's our tutor, our teacher, our schoolmaster leading us to Christ. So the law isn't a throwaway. It's not a nasty thing that you never talk about and never use. Jesus is using it in this incredible witnessing opportunity. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus starts with the Ten Commandments. Now he skips over the first four. What are the first four commandments? You guys really know your, your Bible, so... What are, what are the first four commandments? Love, your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. No other Have no other gods. No what was that? No idols. no idols, right? Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. Remember Sabbath. And there's one other. Don't blaspheme. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, right? Okay. He skipped those. He went right to the ones we usually think of. You know, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't covet. Right? Didn't he? Honor your father and mother. He skipped the first four. Why? Because he was going to come back to those. When Jesus said, one thing you lack, he was getting at this young man's God. His kingdom what he thought he had to have and had to keep. The one thing he thought was more important than eternal life, or the God who could give him eternal life. Jesus didn't skip. Have no other gods before me. When he said, let it go, he was dealing with the issue of this young man's heart. Um, I've I've worked with a lot of rich people over the years. Uh, I live out in, in, I was telling somebody earlier today, I live in a place where people have 20,000 square foot homes. I'm not right in my neighborhood, but you know, <laughs> uh, nearby neighborhoods. There, there are neighborhoods in the Seattle area where the average home is 5,000 square feet. All right, there, there are people who are, you know, Amazon people, Starbucks people, Microsoft people. They made a lot of money on internet startup companies and things like that. And they've had to spend it. So they've spent it on themselves. In other words, you either spend it, you invest it, or give it to Uncle Sam. So, or put it in an offshore account. <laughs> they, uh, they are very hard. Hardened to the gospel. Why is that? Jesus goes on to say this. He looked around at his disciples and he says, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. And Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because he has so much to lose, he thinks. You see, what you have in your hands, what you're hanging on to, always seems like a bigger deal than pie in the sky when you die. The kingdom of God. But can you imagine what the, 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 uh, the wealth Jesus was offering this young man when he said, sell it, give it away, and I'll give you treasure in heaven? Do you think it would have just been equal? Do you think that's the way God is? Oh, no. 
What in the parables Jesus told? When a man took his talent and put it to work and turned it into five, what did Jesus do as a reward? Do you remember? He gave him what the other guy had who didn't take any risks and buried it, remember? And in another story, he gave him ten cities. Remember that? Jesus is incredibly generous, and when you, when you sacrifice or when you open your hands and give him what you have, and say, everything I have is yours. No holes barred, nothing held out, it's all yours. When you're like this, God fills your life and your, your hands to overflowing. In this life and in the life to come. The thing that I, I'd just like to say is this. This young man uh, had some kingdom issues. His wealth, his possessions, his prominence, he was a ruler. His power, because of his influence as a ruler, he was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. Can you think of any better situation? <laughs> rich, young, ruler. Wow, he's got it. What did Jesus ask him? What was his repentance? What was it supposed to look like? Sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Was he asking this man to buy his way into heaven? Is there another way to be saved? Can you just say, okay, Jesus, you can have everything that I own, and automatically you go to heaven? No. He was dealing with this man's kingdom. That which stood between him and the kingdom of God. The cross is always necessary. But our stuff can actually keep us from the cross. The promise he gave this young man, you will have reward in heaven. Let me just stop here for a moment and, and clarify uh, what we're talking about. Let me bring up a black screen and just talk about this because it's so important. <coughs> Jesus never called his sacrifice at the cross the good news. Check it out. He always called the kingdom the good news. Now what was the cross? It was the way in to the kingdom. It's the door. It's the narrow way. It's the access. It's the portal. The only way you can get into the kingdom is through the finished work of Jesus, right? But Jesus did not call his cross and his, his uh, sacrifice for our sins the good news. The kingdom was the good news. Now think about it. If you and I say the door is the big deal. We're being foolish. I was, I was at Claire and Chris's tonight. I didn't stop at the door and say, oh man, what a great access to your home. This is such a nice door. Let's just stand here by the door and appreciate the door. The door is the entrance to their home. And they have a wonderful home. And they've, they've made it beautiful. And it's inviting. And they practice hospitality. <clears throat> Once I got into their home, I forgot all about the door. Yeah, I really did. Now, I've never forgotten about the door to the kingdom of heaven. And I like to hang around the door to help other people in. But I like what's beyond the door. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. The kingdom of God is splendid, beyond imagination. It's home. It's everything my soul has ever longed for. It satisfies the deepest longings of my heart.
to be home in the kingdom. This is where I belong. This is what I was created for. This is good. Now, I got there through the cross. But I'm past the cross, and I'm in the kingdom. And Jesus was, was very clear about the fact that it's the kingdom that's the big deal. The cross is a big deal. Getting into that. But it's what's in the kingdom that's the good news. Now I know that that really strikes you a little bit funny. Because we've always talked about the gospel as the work of Jesus on the cross. But again, remember who is the smartest? It's not us. And it's not our preachers. It's Jesus. What did he say? That's the important thing. All right, let's look at another person, Nicodemus. Does this fit him? John chapter 3. Would you turn there? This is the story of the guy who, come, who came to Jesus by night. He was a very special man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. He was, uh, he was a teacher. In fact, let me put that stuff up there. His kingdom issues was that he was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was Israel's teacher. Jesus said that. Jesus said, Art thou Israel's teacher and don't know this? He was a man of reputation, power, influence, and respect. He was somebody. Now, remember, this was a kingdom discussion. Remember what, uh, what happened? Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, you uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see what? The kingdom of God. So why would you want to be born again? Just to be born again? No. To see the kingdom of God. That's the whole thing I just went through. Explaining that being born again is a means to an end. It takes you somewhere very special. The kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I think he's kind of being deliberately dense here. <laughs> Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel? Are you the Chuck Swindoll of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now here's something that's, that's really important. Why did Jesus use this expression the Son of Man. Was he trying to deliberately confuse us, them at that time and all of us since, about his identity? See, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses say this means that Jesus used the term Son of Man. That means he didn't think he was God. They're absolutely wrong. But that's what they think. They, when Jesus used the term Son of Man, and it's one of his favorite names for himself. He said it many times. They think that he meant Son of Man. You know what he was referring to and what Nicodemus understood he was referring to? Daniel chapter 7. Let me read something to you. Those Jews that Jesus was talking to, especially Nicodemus, who was a student of the Word. He was a Pharisee. He was a 
He had studied the Bible all his life. The Old Testament, he knew like the back of his hand. He knew it frontwards and forwards. When Jesus said, the Son of Man who came down from heaven, Nicodemus could not avoid a particular passage that must have jumped to mind immediately. It's Matthew, or it's Daniel chapter 7. Beginning with verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. Did you get that? One like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. So who is the Son of Man? <laughs> the Lord of all. You see, if you understand the Bible and you know what it says in the Old Testament, when Jesus uses that expression, Son of Man, you know he's not just saying, I'm human. He's saying, I am that selected one of the Father who was given dominion over a kingdom for all eternity. That's who I am. And believe me, Nicodemus would have caught that. So basically what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus is, uh, I'm going to be lifted up and I'm going to draw all men to me. And I'm the Son of Man. And I'm the way into this special kingdom that has been given to me. Let's take a look at uh, what repentance would have looked like here. Be born again, but it also had in it giving up your, his personal kingdom. In other words, what was Nicodemus counting on? So who he was and all he had achieved. He had gotten to the top of the heap. He was part of the elite, the religious elite in Israel. And basically what Jesus was telling them is, you are, you've climbed a ladder leaning against the wrong wall. When, when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, you know how Nicodemus heard that. You've got to start over as if you were a baby. Everything you've achieved hasn't gotten you into the kingdom. I'm the one who can get you into the kingdom. The Son of Man. Look to me. And then he uses that illustration from Exodus, where, uh, or from the Exodus of, of Israel, where they're out in the desert and the people have been bitten, remember, by serpents. And Moses is instructed by God to lift up a brass serpent on a, on a pole. And the instruction is, anyone who looks at the brass serpent will live. And Jesus is bringing that picture back to mind, and he's saying, you need me the way they needed the brass serpent. I'm the way into the kingdom. The promise is that the Holy Spirit would take compliance with that message, Trust in that message and regenerate him now and forever. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. You can't earn your way, you can't achieve your way, all of your accomplishments aren't going to get you there. The Son of Man can get you there. Let's take a look at another person. This is the woman with the worst of reputations, Luke chapter 7. Luke 7, one of, one of my favorite stories, Luke seven thirty six. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table, and behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. 
And now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to him, If this man were a prophet, he said to himself, If this man was a prophet, he would have known who, what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner, yuck, icky. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He read his thoughts. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged right. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, turn toward the woman, He's still talking to Simon. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, and she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kisses, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> Those at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It wasn't her tears that saved her. It wasn't kissing Jesus' feet that saved her. It wasn't anointing his feet with the ointment that saved her. It was what? Her faith. Who did she think Jesus was? God. She needed forgiveness. Who could forgive sins? That's even what they asked at the table. Who could forgive sins? Who does this man think he is? She knew who he was. When he said with authority, your sins are forgiven, you are saved. It was God saying. And the woman knew that. So, what were her kingdom issues? Well, she had sinned herself into a pit. She had done whatever it took to survive without regard to God's ownership or leadership in her life. She did what it seemed at the moment was the necessary thing just to make it through the day, to make it through the week. She sent herself into a life of guilt and shame and rejection by her whole community. Everybody loathed what she had become. Her repentance, her attitude of humility, her absolute respect and honor toward Jesus, her gratitude lavishly poured out, her tears of remorse and of anticipated joy. The evidence of eternal transaction, Jesus' forgiveness, his pronouncement that her faith had saved her, and the evidence is in her grateful heart. Revealed the love of one whose huge debt had been canceled. Jesus was absolutely right in using that story. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He said, well, I don't know if I could witness like that. I'm not Jesus. No, you can't. But you can treat broken people who have been trapped in their sin with the same gentleness, and you can guide them to the same Lord and Savior and watch their lives be transformed through His forgiveness. My friends, there is nobody that is unworthy of the love of Jesus. We know that technically, we know that theoretically. We would say, yes, the lowest sinner, you know, can be saved. God loves everyone. How do we treat real sinners, however? People whose lives are cruddy, who've made a mess of things. How do we actually handle people who are lost, 
in their sin. Well, we tend to be like Simon. God, don't you know, Jesus, don't you know who's touching you? Man, it's disgusting. I mean, this, this obscene display going on in my house. You see, if, if uh, you and I will adopt the attitude of Jesus, we'll see the same kinds of things happen because there are broken, sinful people around us whose lives are a mess, who are absolutely desperate for forgiveness. Waking up in the morning, that's why they do drugs, that's why they do alcohol. Just to live another day. Just to numb themselves so they don't have to face what they've become. All right, those kinds of people are people Jesus loves, and all they need is that arm around them. Many times, they will respond positively to the gospel. I've had quite a ministry in Seattle with uh, sex offenders. I'm talking about men who, who prey on children, pedophiles. They are the lepers of our age. Nobody wants them around. Nobody wants them in their neighborhood. They have to register with the police, and the whole neighborhood in our area has to know that they're there within two miles. If they move, they have to register again, and again, the people, wherever they're moving to, have to be notified. They are the scum of the earth in the American culture. Most professional psychiatrists and psychologists believe that they are incorrigible. In other words, they cannot change. They cannot be helped. Well, I'm here to tell you, people like that can be born again. People like that, with all of their shame, with all of their, their memory of pornographic junk that they poured into their minds for years with all of the, the terrible things they've done to children can be redeemed. And I've seen it happen. We have a church in the prison. The Three Rivers Prison in Monroe, Washington. It's called the, the family, Cascade Family Church. And every Thursday night there's a worship service and it's packed in the Special Offenders Unit. And we have seen men on their faces before God, repenting of their sins, crying out in agony of guilt and shame, and being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. One of my best friends is a man who uh, was a pedophile. He molested his own daughter. He came to Christ, absolute surrender. God, you can have the rest of my life. He's a changed man. He's a remarkable man. His ministry now is to sex offenders. He goes back into the prison. He, he goes back into those court-mandated therapy groups with his story. And they let him come. The officials let him come because he's kind of their poster boy. He was a guy who wrote out of this stuff. But I so admire this man. He's got more guts than I do. More courage. He goes where I couldn't go. But I love it. His sins were forgiven. Just like this woman. And you and I can be the arms of Jesus and the heart of Jesus. Every time I, uh, I do this, someone in the audience, um, either before or after or during the, the conference when I'm teaching this, says, Pastor Jan, you have just simply gotten caught up in the error of Lordship salvation. <laughs> There's got to be a simple faith-only message. And that is the fallacy of our age. 
that somehow you don't have to do anything except believe. You don't have to bow. You don't have to release your kingdom. You don't have to come under God's authority. Faith doesn't have anything to do with who Jesus is. It's just what he's done. I'm telling you tonight that's false. You do have to take into consideration that Jesus is God of very God. That your forgiver is also your sovereign Lord. And when you take a gift from the sovereign Lord of the universe, who he is determines how you respond to the gift. If I give you a gift of forgiveness, if I give you absolution as a priest or a father or a pastor, it's my word. But when he gives it, it has all the weight of the Godhead and all the authority of heaven behind it. The bandit at the cross is not a deathbed conversion that doesn't take into consideration who Jesus is. This is not a guy who skins in by the skin of his teeth. Look at this. Who was he? He was a bandit. He was a thief. His, he and his buddy talking there said, we deserve what we're getting. This man is innocent. That's what he said to his, his friend being crucified beside him. He had done whatever it took to get what he wanted. He had made his own rules. He lived in the kingdom of self. <coughs> what were the evidences of repentance in him? Don't you fear God? The fear of God means the respect for who God is, for his authority. Don't you fear God? He recognized Jesus as the king of God's kingdom. He asked to be included. And he was promised, today you will be with me in paradise. And I said the, uh, yesterday, what an amazing place to find your king. How, think of the faith it takes to believe the guy who crucified next to you is the king of the universe. That, isn't that kind of a leap of faith? What's the king of the universe doing here beside me getting crucified? But he had gotten enough of the, of, of the identity of Jesus that he knew Jesus was the king of the eternal kingdom of heaven. And he asked to be included, and Jesus said, yeah, you got it, you're in. You're going to be with me today. The outcomes of the gospel of the kingdom are like this. It usually starts, and with this we're going to close, it usually starts with someone just saying, you know, I've made a mess of things, I'm sick of it, I'm frustrated with the way my life is going, I need help. And my friends, I used to take people to the cross at that point. When somebody came in and they were just disgusted with the way their life was going, they're disappointed, they're frustrated, I'd say, hey, I know who can make your life better. I'd take them to the cross. And I've learned not to do that. I don't do that anymore. I work with them. I ask them to keep thinking and studying with me, but I don't immediately take them to the cross. Then there's the, the people who are at the, the guilt and grief level. They're just not only sick of the way their life is working, they're, they're really sick of themselves. They're basically saying, I have, I have done horrible things. I have done really bad things. I am not good person. I need forgiveness and another chance. And usually that's what they talk about. Another chance or a do-over. You ever hear people talk like that? I, I need to start over. And I don't take them to the cross either. What I'm waiting for is some acknowledgement of who Jesus is. And I tell them who Jesus is. And I, I Teach them God's Word and what God says in His Word about who Jesus is. Because what I've learned is that I've got to get to the control level, not just the guilt and grief level or the frustration level. I've got to get to that level where they realize that why their life isn't working and why they're so guilty is because of the way they've been treating Jesus. Why 
their life is messed up has to do with the fact that Jesus is not their leader. And he deserves to be. So here's where I take them to the cross. We start talking about the leadership of Jesus. Who's running our life? Who controls your life? Would you be willing to release control of your life? And at that point, they're ready for the bridge. They're ready for the access to heaven. The entrance. The cross. Repentance, again, remember, is changing your mind about who ought to be in control. It's not just changing your mind about whether you're a sinner or not, or changing direction. It's that. But more than that, it's changing your mind about who ought to be in control. When Jesus puts repentance alongside the kingdom over and over and over and over, he's talking about changing kingdoms. Changing your mind about kingdoms. Not just changing your mind about your sin. Why is this so important? Because without <coughs> surrender, following, and obedience don't happen. If somebody comes to Christ just to get fixed or just to get clean, more often than not, they don't go into a, a life of obedience. You say, well, what about the personal relationship? Let me tell you about, about that. You and I, when we come to Jesus, have the right to a personal relationship, a love relationship, a friendship. It is true that when you become a Christian, you have now a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But it is a personal love relationship that swirls around obedience. Let me explain. I have a daughter. She's now 40 years old. She's a wonderful woman. She sings like an angel. Uh, I can't wait till next Sunday. She's going to be singing in my, my brother's church in Wisconsin. And she's going to sing two of my favorite songs. Hopefully the one she sings at my funeral, if she's able to. Someday. Uh, she sings a song called Come to Jesus that is, melts me every time. But boy, could she turn me around her little finger as a little girl. She was just the cutest little blonde. And she was so sweet and she was, I mean, she was daddy's little girl. You have to understand how much I love that little girl. And she could talk me into just about anything. And she could talk me out of discipline. And the boys, you know, were really, really jealous. <laughs> Two sons. Dad, you treat her different than you treat us. She doesn't get near as many spankings as we do. There was a time when she was about six or seven years old when she got pretty naughty, pretty disrespectful and disobedient. And here's how she would do it. She would, she would get way off the track, I mean, off the reservation. And then when I would come to her to deal with it, and we had a whole process that we did in our child training, she would throw her arms around my neck, and she would go, Daddy, I love you, I love you, I love you. <coughs> what was she doing? <laughs> she was working me, you're right. She was manipulating me. <clears throat> exactly. Was it easy for me to accept that? No. I mean, even as much as, you know, I loved her, and as much as she had me in her power, I knew what she was doing. And I resented it. Because I wanted an obedient daughter. I wanted her to show me she loved me, not by throwing her arms around me and telling me she loved me. I wanted her to show me she loved me by obeying me. And I'm here to tell you, God is just as smart as I am, and a lot more. 
When you, when you come running to Him and say, Oh, Father God, I love You, I love You, I love You, but you're not obeying Him, don't think you have a personal relationship with Him. You have violated that relationship, and sin always separates. Right? Always. Even with God. And God doesn't play those games. And He's not all wrapped, you know, he do, we don't have Him wrapped around our little finger. What He's asking for is obedience. John 14 and 15 is so clear. If you love me, Jesus said, what? Obey. Obey me. If you love me, show me. Obey me. God's love language is obedience. No question about it. <coughs> Abiding is so important. Living in that friendship and love with, with God is so precious. But unless it's connected to following and obedience, it's just rhetoric. And then what God leads you to, if you're following and abiding, is an overcoming level. That's where He begins to trust you and uh, knows that you're going to follow through and be consistent, reliable, dependable. Let me give you just a glimpse of why that's important to God. I'm convinced, and this, you know, some of this is holy speculation, some of it is understanding the scriptures. When Satan and his angels fell, the principalities and powers, I believe they were the, the administration of the universe. They were the ones God was putting weight down on. And they were doing God's will in, in level, at a level of authority and responsibility. They have fallen. They are no longer there. I believe that the reason they hate us, the church, is because God has designed that we are their replacements. And they hate us. And they'll do anything to discredit us and cause us to stumble. But I believe that God is... Remember what... The last two chapters of the Bible tell us about ourselves. Where are we going to be in eternity future? Not just in heaven. Where? At the right hand of God. Reigning and ruling with Christ. I don't know what all that means. I just know it is an enormous privilege to reign and rule with Christ. But the book of Revelation, I don't all through it talks about overcomers. In other words, people who deal with what God has put on their plate successfully so that He can lift them up and reward them and say, come up to the higher place. Sit beside me on my throne. You're reliable. I can trust you. With free will. And I can trust you to follow for the rest of eternity. That's what God's after. So the why of surrender is all of this. But that's why it is such a catastrophe when people say, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'm trusting Christ as my Savior, but they don't follow. And they're not reliable. And they're not overcomers. Because they're living still for themselves. That's why this kingdom concept, this kingdom language of Jesus is so key to actually following through and living a Christian life successfully. I started by saying Jesus is the most intelligent being in the universe. I'm, I'm going to close by saying he is absolutely the most faithful, trustworthy, loving intelligence in the universe. But never forget how smart he is. When you read his word, read it for the incredible genius that's behind it. The written word reveals the living word. The smartest man who ever lived. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the uh, joy of rehearsing these things tonight. And I pray that 
that if there's anyone who came to Jesus just simply at the frustration level or at the guilt and grief level, that by now they've come to the surrender level. And I pray that even tonight, if there's someone here who has not yet surrendered and come to the cross in humility and said, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me. I pray that they'll do that, knowing full well that that means that he is not only their forgiver, but their leader. Forevermore. Help us, Lord, to exchange kingdoms with you. In humility, and by your grace, step into a new kingdom that can never be taken away from us. Thank you for this message. It's beautiful. It's mysterious. It's wonderful. It's the subject of all your parables. And it's the subject of your gospel. Lord, help us to leave, to leave tonight meditating on these things, thinking about it, and thinking about how to explain the entrance to the kingdom to our friends who, who don't yet know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.